verses. So Psalms chapter number 2, and we'll start reading in verse number 1. Psalms chapter number 2, and verse number 1. The Bible says, Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. All right, so here tonight, even though this is 12 verses, you know, we could probably spend a couple of weeks on this one chapter because what it is dealing with and what we're going to see here tonight, for the most part, is it, it is talking about the millennial reign of Christ. And so we'll see that here this evening. In fact, go back to the first couple verses there and just look at what the Bible says in verses 1 through 3. The Bible said there, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now stop reading there. Just in those first three verses there, one thing that we see there is that when people take counsel against, uh, against the Lord, they also take counsel against his anointed and when they take counsel against God and when they go against the Lord they also thereby go against the people of God because is there anything that the world can do to God himself no they can't touch God they can't do anything to God Satan can't certainly uh, harm God so who does Satan go after them Satan goes after the saved. He goes after the sons of God, the people of God, is who he goes after. In fact, go ahead and mark this, but go to John chapter number 15 very quickly here tonight. John chapter number 15, and look at verse number 18. See what Christ told us about this over there. John chapter number 15, and look down at verse number 18. And the Bible says this in John chapter number 15, and verse number 18. The Bible says right there, If the world hate you... Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. So stop reading there. The Bible is pretty clear. Jesus was pretty clear, wasn't he? That if they hated Christ, then they will also hate who? They also hate us. So there's a lesson there for Christians that if the world does not hate you, why is it that they do not hate you? Because you're like them, right? Because you're living like the world and, and you're living just like them, acting just like them. But if you are a Christian who is following God, if you're living godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says all they that shall live godly shall what? Shall suffer persecution. And so we will be persecuted if they persecuted Christ, who was perfect, by the way. I mean, they could not find anything against him to truly make an accusation against him. And we are not perfect. And they certainly, if they tried hard enough, they could probably find something to accuse us of because we're not perfect, are we? And so if they hated Christ, 
then they will also hate us and they will persecute the church of God. Now take your Bibles, go to Revelation chapter number 12 and look what the Bible has to say there. Because this uh, book here, or that chapter in Revelation, or in Psalms chapter number 2 there, uh, the main context of that chapter is talking about the millennial reign of Christ. And so let's go ahead and look at some of the end times in that context of the world hating Christians and how that Satan will come after Christians. Look at what the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 12 and look down at verse number 17. The Bible says right there, Revelation 12 verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of of Jesus Christ. So who is Satan going to make war with in the end times? Who's the Antichrist going to make war with? He's going to make war with the saved because Satan, he hates God. They take counsel against God and against the Lord's anointed. And so they are going to make war against the saints. Look at chapter number 13. We end with that thought in chapter 12 there and then in chapter 13 he goes right into that look down at verse number seven the bible says right there and it was given unto him to make war with who the saints, the saints. now there are those that say well once you get past chapter four the church is not mentioned anymore and it's all about the jews well here's the thing you get into the, the book of revelation the jews are not mentioned either in fact, the, there's only 12 tribes of Israel that are mentioned only two times in the book of Revelation. That's when it's talking about the 144,000, not even talking about the whole nation. And the only time that the Bible actually mentions the Jews in the book of Revelation is in the first couple of chapters when it says that they basically are liars and they are of the synagogue of Satan. And so it calls them of the synagogue of Satan. And so when we read the Bible and we read about the saints in the book of Revelation, are we just going to automatically say that that's the Jews? No, that would be ridiculous to do that. By the way, one of the uh, 144,000, there's one tribe that's not even mentioned in those 12 tribes. That's kind of replaced there in the 144,000. And that's the tribe of Dan. Go look it up sometime, Revelation 7, Revelation chapter 14, and you won't find the tribe of Dan there, so not even all 12 tribes are even mentioned there when it mentions the tribes of Israel. And so when we read about the saints of God, who are we reading about? We're reading about the saved believers in Christ. Look down at what the Bible has to say. In fact, go, down to, uh, go over to Revelation chapter 19, and look at verse number 11, Revelation 19. And verse number 11, and we're going to kind of skip through a lot of uh, the, uh, before the before the millennial reign because we're going to mainly focus on the millennial reign of Christ here tonight. And where that begins in the book of Revelation is Revelation chapter 19. Look at what the Bible says there in Revelation 19 verse number 11. And the Bible says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse... And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness. He doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the who? The so who are we talking about here? The word of God is who? Jesus Christ, right? That's who it is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is Jesus Christ. Look at what the Bible says in verse 14. Here's where we are. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them, notice with what? A rod of iron. Now, didn't we read about that back in Psalms chapter 2? It talks about the rod of iron there. Look at what the Bible says there again. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, didn't we also read about the wrath of God in Psalms 2? Absolutely did. We'll go back to it in a little bit. Look at verse 16. And he 
And verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So this goes right in context with Psalms chapter 2, doesn't it? That they take counsel against the Lord's anointed. And here in Revelation chapter 19, we see the armies and the kings, the beasts, the Antichrist coming to make war against Jesus Christ when he returns. This is what is called the Battle of Armageddon. This is the battle that takes place here. And notice who gets wiped out. Is it all the earth at this time? Every single sinner on the face of the earth that's getting wiped out? No, it's the armies that are gathered against him. Those armies and the kings of the earth and those great men and the Antichrist is who is about to get wiped out. Look at what the Bible says in verse number 20. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And so this is the event that's going to begin the millennial reign of Christ. From this point forward, Jesus Christ will rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. And he's going to reign with what? What did the Bible say? With a rod of iron. Now does that sound like he's just coming just be peaceful and soft and just kind of laid back? No, he's coming to rule and to reign. I mean, we will even see in the scripture, I don't know if we'll have time to look at it tonight, but you'll even see in the book of Zechariah, for example, I believe it is, that you'll see that in the end times they're going to keep uh, uh, one of the feasts and everybody in the, in the entire world will be forced, whether they're saved or not, will be forced to come to Jerusalem to keep that feast there, to worship God and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they don't, you can read there that Jesus says that he will punish them that he will send a famine upon them and punish that land if they will not come up to keep that feast that he talks about there in the book of Zechariah, that he is going to rule with a rod of iron. The Bible tells us that the law shall go forth from Zion. And we're going to talk about Zion tonight and what that means. But can you imagine all the great preachers that are out there in the world that have great knowledge of the word of God and just think what it will be at that time to be taught the word of God from Jesus Christ himself. I mean, no more arguing about doctrine, right? I mean, if you want to know whether you're right on doctrine or not, you'll be able to learn that because the law will go forth from Zion. I believe at that time, those that uh, will be raptured up before this and come back with Christ during this time, we are going to rule and reign with him, the Bible says. I believe one of our jobs also will be to teach the law to the earth. That during these days, there will not be a famine of the word of God. There will not be a famine of the laws of God. Everyone will know the laws of God. And won't that be wonderful? Because you think about the laws of man here today. Anybody know all the laws of man in our country? No, I mean, we probably break laws in this world, and we don't even know them. Those that enforce the laws don't even know all the laws, do they? You get pulled over by a police officer, and that police officer doesn't necessarily know all the laws. In fact, I guarantee you that they don't. You know why? Because I see soldiers that is all the time that get kicked out of apartment complexes or get kicked out of homeowners associations for going and going soldering and preaching the word of God and the police officer kicks them out. Hey, the police officer doesn't even know the law because he's not enforcing the law. He's actually going contrary to the law. 
Because the Supreme Court has already ruled that we have the authority and the right to go into any subdivision, to go into any apartment complex, and to preach the Word of God that it is the right of each separate individual to have the right to tell you yes or no, and no apartment complex or homeowners association can make that decision for them. The Supreme Court's already ruled on that. I have paperwork in my phone that I could show you on that from lawyers that I have that that you can see where it's already been ruled on, written up, but police officers don't know that law. They don't know the laws, even the laws of man. But during this time, the laws of God will be known. Now take your Bibles, go back to Psalms chapter number 2, and let's continue going through that chapter there. Psalms chapter number 2. And look down at verse number 4 and see what the Bible has to say. Psalms chapter number 2. And look at verse number 4. And the Bible says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now let's stop reading there. Who is the king there that he's talking about that has been set up on the holy hill of Zion? Who is that king? It's Jesus Christ is who it's talking about. Look at the next verse, and then we'll look at some scripture on it. The Bible says in verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee? Now, go, take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter number 13, and I'll prove for you definitively that that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Acts chapter number 13, and look at verse number 33. See what the Bible has to say there. Acts chapter number 13, and look down to verse number 33. And the Bible says right there in the book of Acts chapter number 13, verse number 33, the Bible says, God hath fulfilled... The same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up, who? Jesus, again, as it is also written, where? In the second Psalm. You see how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament? Written in the second Psalm, so we know we got the right book, right? The right chapter, and notice what it says, direct quote, what we just read. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, as con- and as concerning And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And so we know definitively that this from, you compare it with Psalms chapter number 2, who is the king there that's being spoken of? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, obviously. And, of course, the book of Hebrews also quotes this because in Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 5, the Bible says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And so it's talking definitively about Jesus Christ. Now go back there to Psalms 2 and notice what else it says in that verse. Psalms chapter number 2, verse Number six, it says, yet have I set my king upon where? My holy hill of Zion. Now, here's the question. What is Zion? Anybody got the answer to that? If I were to ask you what or where is Zion, do you know the answer to that? Anybody have a guess? Uh, you're close. Let's go ahead and look at it in the Bible. It's actually two places in the Bible. So take your Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter number 12, and look at verse number 22, and look at what the Bible has to say there. Hebrews chapter number 12, and look down at verse number 22, see what the Bible has to say. Hebrews chapter number 12, and verse number 22, see what the Bible has to say there. And the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter number 12, and verse number 22, The Bible says this right there, but ye are come unto the mount, what's it say? Sion. Now, it's just spelt a little differently differently here, but it's the same word, Sion. It says, but ye are come unto the mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God. So we know it's a city, right? 
In what city? Well, the Bible tells us the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And so Zion or Zion is according to the Bible it is heaven. That that is what Zion is, but I told you it's also two places, right? That there is another place that it is. You see, one is heavenly and one is physical here on this earth. Another place that is also called uh, Zion in the Bible. But before we go there, go to Revelation 4.1 and I'll show you another scripture that again shows us that Zion is heaven. Look at Revelation chapter number 14 and look at verse number 1. And look at what the Bible has to say there, Revelation chapter number 14. And yes, Revelation 14 and verse number 1. The Bible says this in Revelation 14, verse number 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion. Now, where did we just read that that was? In heaven. So where's the lamb standing here? In heaven, right? And we can verify that just with this chapter alone, even without the book of Hebrews. Look at what the Bible says. It says, and with him 144,000, so there's 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from where? From heaven. As the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before where? The throne. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. So get what it's saying here. The Lamb is standing, standing on Mount Sion. There's the hundred and forty four thousand in heaven singing before the throne. There's a voice that's being heard from heaven. And no man can learn the song, but the hundred and forty four thousand. So then, just from this one chapter, where is Sion? It's in heaven, right? According to the Bible, that is Zion. Now, take your Bibles, go back to the Old Testament, and go to 2 Samuel chapter number 5, and look at verse number 7, because I told you it's actually two places in the Bible that is called uh, Zion. Number one is heaven is called that. But look at what the Bible has to say in 2 Samuel 5, 7. By the way, that's why we sing the song. You should have known this just from singing the song, right? We sing the, the famous hymn, Marching to where? To Zion. Hey, where are we going? Where are we marching to? To heaven, right? That's, uh, you should have known that one just from the hymn. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter number 5. And look at verse number 7. See what the Bible says there. And the Bible says this in 2 Samuel chapter number 5 and verse number 7. The Bible says right there, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is what? The city of David. So there is a stronghold that David here captures, I believe, from the Jebusites. And he captures this city, and this city is called Zion, and it is also called in the Bible the city of David. Now, what city is that that is called the city of David? Well, take your Bibles. Let's look at some other scripture to figure it out. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 8, and look at what the Bible has to say there. 1 Kings chapter number 8, and look at verse number 1. 1 Kings chapter number 8. And verse number 1, see what the Bible has to say there. 1 Kings chapter number 8 and verse number 1. And the Bible says this in 1 Kings chapter number 8, verse number 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of all Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers and of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon, where? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David which is Zion. Now, the Bible just told us it's not Jerusalem, right? You see, a lot of people would say, well, Zion, that is Jerusalem. They are in Jerusalem, and they are bringing the Ark of the Covenant up out of the city of David. Notice it says up out of the city of David. That's important for a reason. Go to Matthew chapter number 24, and look at what the Bible has to say there. Matthew chapter number 24 
and look at verse number one. Go ahead and turn over there. Now, this is important because today there is a portion of land over in Israel that is a very disputed piece of land, right? There in Jerusalem, Jerusalem has gone back and forth throughout the ages of being controlled by the Christians, the Crusaders, the Muslims. And today, you know, Jerusalem is in control, uh, controlled by Israel. But the Temple Mount, what is called the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock is for the Muslims, is controlled by the Muslims today, right? And it's a very disputed piece of land. And you have that, what's called the Wailing Wall there in Jerusalem. And, the, and many people will say, well, that Wailing Wall, that wall is what is left of the temple. Now, let's see if there's anything left of the temple. Look at Matthew chapter number 24 and look on down at what the Bible has say, Matthew chapter 24, verse number 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple... And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. What did Jesus Christ just say? Is there going to be a wall left standing? No, much less not even one stone of the temple left upon another. And why is that? Because the temple, if you remember what the temple is described as, the temple was overlaid in gold. I mean, solid gold. So when the Romans came in and they destroyed it, don't you think they'd take it completely apart to get all that gold? And you see, that's exactly what happened in 70 A.D. And not one stone was left there upon another. So we can know very conclusively from what Jesus Christ said that that wailing wall out there that the Jews worship, and yes, they do worship it. I'm not even going to, going to go into the disgusting things that they're imitating there at the wall. But that wall that they are worshiping there, where they take their little, those little letters and they put it in there. And all the politicians will put on their little yarmulke and they'll go visit that wailing wall. You know, that wall is not part of the temple. Because Jesus said not one stone would be left upon it. So are we going to believe what men today say? Or are we going to believe what Jesus Christ said? We're going to believe what Jesus Christ said. Plus, that where that wall is doesn't even line up with what the Bible says. In fact, what we will see here tonight is that where the temple was, was actually in what is called the city of David. You see, the city of David is a few thousand feet to the south beneath the wailing wall beneath where that temple mount is. That is where the city of David is located. It's a fortress. The Bible says that where the temple was, one of the prophecies that God gave was that the temple would be destroyed and that it would be a plowed field. That it would be completely plowed. Now listen, has that ha happened on the temple mount? No, it has not has not happened there on what they call the Temple Mount, but where the city of David was, it sure has happened. That's where it took place from, was down there. Now let's take our Bibles, go to 1 Chronicles chapter number 21, look at verse number 22, and we're getting pretty deep here tonight in the Bible, so you got to kind of keep all these puzzles, pieces of the puzzle in your head and kind of put them together. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter number 21, and look down at verse number 22 and see what the Bible has to say there. 1 Chronicles chapter number 21 and verse number 22. Now remember, back when uh, we were reading earlier, I believe in 2 Samuel, when David took the stronghold that is called Zion, the city of David. I told you that he captured that city from what group of people? The Jebusites. Now look at what the Bible says here in 1 Chronicles Chapter number 21, and look down at verse number 22 and see what the Bible has to say there. First Chronicles 21 and verse number 22. And the Bible says right there, Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people... 
And Ornon said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering, I give it all. And King David said to Ornon, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave to Ornon for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of, of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel and he put up his sword again into the sheath there of. Now stop reading there. We could go back and read quite a bit of this. But Ornan was a Jebusite. That's why this is important. David goes in here and he buys this place, the threshing floor, from Ornon and builds an altar there. Now take your Bibles. Let's go ahead and go somewhere else in the Bible and go ahead and turn, turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter number 3 and look what the Bible has to say there. 2 Chronicles chapter number 3 and look at verse number 1. We'll see that this place that David just bought from Ornon, the Jebusite, is the exact place that the Bible says that the temple was built. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and look down at verse number 1. 2 Chronicles chapter number 3 and verse number 1. The Bible says this in 2 Chronicles chapter number 3 and verse number 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornon the Jebusite. So where was the temple built? In this exact place that we just read about, at the threshing floor of Ornon the Jebusite, which we will see in the Bible is in the city of David. Take your Bibles, go to Psalms chapter number 76, look at verse number 1. And see what the Bible has to say there. Psalms chapter number 76. And look down at verse number 1. See what the Bible has to say there. Psalms chapter number 76 and verse number 1. I know we're looking at a lot of scripture here tonight. And, uh, and looking pretty deep into this. But this is all going to bring a clear picture for us of something later on. Look at what the Bible says in Psalms chapter number 76. And look down at verse number 1. See what the Bible has to say there. Psalm 76 and verse number 1. And the Bible says, in Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In what? Salem. Salem also is his what? Tabernacle. Now, Salem is another name for Jerusalem. Now, remember, the city of David is just a thousand feet to the south of, uh, of the Temple Mount, which is in Jerusalem. So this whole area could be called Jerusalem. Look at what the Bible says. And his dwelling place, where? In Zion. So God's dwelling place was in what city? Zion. Zion is called what? The city of David, Bethlehem, is where that was at in the Word of God. Take your Bibles, go to Isaiah chapter number 8, and look at verse number 17. Isaiah chapter number 8. And verse number 17, see what the Bible has to say there, Isaiah chapter number 8, and verse number 17, Isaiah chapter number 8, and look at verse number 17. Now, some people would say, well, the book of Psalms, what we just read there, that was before the temple was built, and it was. That was during the time when, when there was just the tabernacle, that tent that they would set up, and it was set up there in Zion is where the tabernacle was set up. Remember, we read earlier that they were going to bring up the Ark of the Covenant out of the city of David up into Jerusalem, right? That's what we read earlier according to the Bible. Look at what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 8. Now, the book of Isaiah is well after the temple has been built. Right, Because the book of Isaiah, now we're past David, we're past Solomon, we're past Solomon's son, we're well in the future where now Israel has turned against God and they're about to be removed into captivity. Look at what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 8. Look down at verse number, verse number 17. The Bible says right there, Isaiah 8, verse number 17, And I will wait upon the Lord 
that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I'll look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel for the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in where? In Mount Zion. So still here, where is God dwelling? In Mount Zion. Zion, Mount Zion is what mountain? That is the city of David in the word of God, that stronghold that David had conquered and had basically made that place his home. That's where uh, even Solomon, when Solomon uh, gets married to one of his many wives, I forget which one it was, but one of his wives, uh, he takes that wife, and before he builds a house for her, he brings her to the city of David for her to dwell in because it was a stronghold. It was a fort. It was a walled city. He brought her there before the wall was finished around the city of Jerusalem. Now take your Bibles here. Go to Isaiah chapter number 2. Look at verse number 3. Isaiah chapter number 2. Look down to verse number 3. And look at what the Bible has to say in Isaiah chapter number 2, verse number 3. Why is all that important? What does that have to do with the millennial reign? Well, look at what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 2. And look at verse number 3. And the Bible says right there in Isaiah chapter number 2 and verse number 3. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. What mountain is that? Mount Zion, right? The city of David. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from where? Jerusalem. So this is where Christ is going to reign from. You see why this is important to the millennial reign? Seeing where Christ is going to dwell from, specifically that city of David that is there in Jerusalem, that that is where Christ is going to rule and to reign from, that the law will go forth, the Bible says, from Zion according to the word of God. And listen, isn't this, doesn't this just put a good picture? Doesn't it just make sense that the place where God told David to purchase God told him to purchase it, to build an altar there, to worship to God. And then the temple was put there in that place and built on that exact site. Doesn't it make sense that that is exactly where Jesus Christ will rule from? And that all the nations will come up and worship Christ and learn from Christ and learn the laws of God. And the laws shall go forth, the Bible says, from Zion. Now you see why the Jews did not understand this and got this wrong. You see, when Jesus Christ came on this earth, what were the Jews looking for? What was Israel looking for? And what are they still looking for today, by the way? They were looking for an earthly king to come, right? They were looking for an earthly king to come and to reign and to conquer their enemies and to reign over this earth. That's why when Jesus Christ came, they didn't recognize him. They they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ because they're looking for some kind of military leader to come. And you see, they had part of that right, but what they didn't understand is that the Bible tells us in Romans chapter number 11 that out of Zion will come a deliverer. That out of Zion comes deliverance. Well, what Zion is he coming from to bring deliverance? Remember, there's two Zions, right? He's coming out of heaven, Revelation 19, coming to rule and to reign on this earth at that time. And then he will set up his government there at Zion. That city of David is exactly where Jesus Christ is going to rule and to reign from. Now go back to Psalms chapter number 2. Let's finish out that chapter there. I know we got a little bit deep on that to show all that to you, but go back to Psalms chapter number 2 and look at what the Bible has to say in verse number 9. Psalms chapter number 2 and look at verse number 9. The Bible says this in Psalms chapter number 2 and verse number 9. And it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. We already read about that. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a ponder's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, 
lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You see why this is talking about the wrath of God and telling the judges and the kings of the earth to kiss the son, lest he be angry? Because Jesus is literally going to rule and reign from Zion. And if you remember when we went through the book of Revelation, when you get through all the judgments of God that come on this earth, you get to the final three woes. And each woe is worse than the one that comes before. I mean, one woe gets finished, and it basically says, Woe unto them that dwell on the earth. Not because of what's come in the past, but because of what's about to come in the future. And the very last woe is Jesus Christ coming. The very last woe is Jesus Christ ruling and reigning on this earth because he's going to reign with a rod of iron. You see, the laws of God that God has put in his word, I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, this is what we're going to use as our laws. These things right here, you know what that means for the earth? That means adulterers put to death. That means sodomites put to death. I mean, that means the rapist put to death and the child molester put to death. And then all these laws of God that Israel never perfectly followed and never perfectly instituted in their days and in their lives because we have that example just from Jesus Christ telling us that Moses had given them a writ of divorcement because of the hardness of their hearts. But Jesus Christ said from the beginning it was not so. Why? Because God had made them male and female you see the laws of god were never perfectly followed even by the most righteous kings in the word of god even by david even by solomon during their reigns israel never perfectly followed the law of god because uh, no man can do that perfectly right but when jesus comes back he is perfect and when jesus rules and reigns on this earth he's going to be a perfect king his law is perfect. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And you know what? This world during the millennial reign of Christ, even though Christ is ruling with a rod of iron, it's going to be a whole lot better than it is now. Because just think, if, if Jesus Christ is putting people to death for adultery, you think there's going to be a whole lot of adultery going on in this world when it's illegal? Probably not. By the way, divorce will be illegal it will not be allowed. You know, that's going to protect a whole lot of families. This world is going to be a whole lot better off with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning. But woe unto them that will not hear the law. Woe unto them that will not believe. And by the way, there will still be people during that millennial reign that will not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will, at the end of that time, be cast into the lake of fire. Now, let's, let's finish with Revelation 2. Go over there. Revelation chapter number 2. Finish what the Bible has to say there. Revelation chapter number 2. And look at verse number 26. And the Bible says this in Revelation chapter number 2. And verse number 26. The Bible says right there. And he that overcometh. Now, who's the overcomer? That's anybody who's saved is who that is. Read 1 John 5, and it defines for us what an overcomer is, that we overcome by our faith, the Bible says. So the overcomer is somebody that's saved, but notice what else it says. And he that overcometh and does what? Keepeth my works unto them. To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule with them, rule them with a rod of iron, as vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Now what did Christ just tell us? To those that are not only saved, but are saved and keep the laws of God, and keep the commandments of God, that they are going to rule with Christ with a rod of iron. You see, those that are faithful to Christ, the Bible teaches that to them will he be given to rule over ten cities that you're going to be given cities actually to rule over in this world if you keep the commandments of God. But if you don't, hey, you're still saved. You're still going to be there, but you're going to be the soldier. You're going to be the one that's not ruling over the cities. You might be the toilet cleaner, right? You might be the one that's at the lowliest position 
in the kingdom of God. But you know what? That's still better than being lost, isn't it? Still better than going to hell. Uh, But you know what? If you want to be rewarded by God, you want to rule and reign in that millennial kingdom and be given cities to rule over, then you need to be keeping the commandments of God now. You need to know the laws of God now. You need to know His commandments because how then can I rule and enforce the commandments and the laws of God if I don't know them? You see, I have to know them in order to enforce them. And at this time, if you want to be at that point where you're given this reward of reigning with a rod of iron, then you need to be keeping the commandments of God now. Let's end in a word of prayer here tonight. That finishes off Psalms 2.